Good well, afternoon and welcome to the Ontario Invasive Plant Council's 2017-2018 Winter Webinar Series. My name is Colin Casson and I am the coordinator of the Ontario Invasive Plant Council and I'm hosting today's webinar from Peterborough, Ontario. If this is your first time joining OIPC for Winter Webinar Series, welcome. If you're a customer, welcome back. This marks the final webinar in our fifth annual Winter Webinar Series. I want to thank the MRF for their support of the event. Uh, we enabled us to deliver one of the most popular series to date. Recordings of all our past webinar from this year and previous years are posted on our website at www.ontarioinvasiveplants.ca slash webinars. We encourage you to make use of them, especially as we get into the time of year where we're trying to new field crews. We've had fantastic speakers over recent weeks who have brought us up to speed on a number of interesting topics such as biological control processes in Canada, the Franklin's Emergency Use Registration and Herbicide Treatment Program that's happening in Long Point and Rondo. We have a focused history of purple stripe spread and corresponding biological control efforts. We had a webinar on the priority aquatic invasive plants to watch for that are spread across Ontario, species like water soldier, European water chestnut, uh, Asian water milfoil. We have a webinar on community engagement in invasive species initiatives, and we've had another uh, a set of great webinars as well, so check them out. Thank you to those of you who have attended these webinars, and we encourage all attendees to take this opportunity to become members of the Ontario Invasive Plant Council. The great benefits of becoming an OIPC member is that you have a say in which webinars we're going to be including in the 2018-2019 Winter Webinar Series. Member info is available on our website in the top right corner of the homepage by clicking Join. Okay, house co uh, housekeeping notes before we begin today's webinar. All attendees have been placed on mute for the duration of today's session. We encourage you to introduce yourself by typing your name and organizational affiliation into the chat feature on the right side of your screen, not the Q box. It's great to friends from across Ontario joining in today, and a special welcome to our neighbors from Wisconsin, Michigan, and other neighboring states joining us today. Our guest speaker will begin the presentation momentarily which will for approximately 45 minutes, and then we'll pivot into a Q&A period where we encourage you all to ask any questions that come to mind to our guest expert. Feel free to note your questions at any time using the chat feature on the right. With let's get on to the show. Today's presentation will be delivered by Michael McTavish, PhD candidate at the University of Waterloo in the Conservation and Restoration Ecology, or CARE Lab, with Dr. Stephen Murphy work is focused on exotic species as sources of ecological novelty and implications for conservation and restoration. Recent studies have focused on the novel interactions of exotic earthworms with restoration amendments including seeds, mulch, and wood ash. This research is to understand and integrate the novel impacts of exotic earthworms into restoration planning to enhance the efficiency and efficacy of managing invaded ecosystems. Thanks for your research with us today. I've unmuted you, and I'm going to turn the controls over to you now. Here we go. Hopefully, uh, we've got our sound and everything working perfectly here today. Thanks for joining us. A uh, big thank you to the OIPC and to Colin for having me out for this. i have been really looking forward to it. Um, I should say at the top here as well, uh, I opted to do this one from home because it's just a little bit more quiet than the lab and the office. So uh, as a heads up, if there are any unplanned contributions from, say, uh, either the cats or uh, doorbells or something like that, apologies in advance. Uh, let's get into it. Uh, so I'm talking about exotic earthworms, as Colin has said. Um, this is sort of a general look at the topic, um, sort of thinking about some of the implications, what these species mean <coughs> uh, for plant invasion and restoration more broadly. Now, in here is very much aware uh, one of the major challenges facing conservation and restoration, broadly speaking, is biological invasion. Uh, we have new species that arrive from somewhere else, they enter a new ecosystem. Uh, we have ecological novelty, and this can take different forms. Uh, you have novel biological diversity by virtue of having new species there that weren't previously. So, and sort of less obviously, you have novel biological interactions occurring. And the interaction between the recent arrivals and species that are already present, between uh, different invaders at the same time, and so forth. And these can quite, get quite complex and can pose some very challenging questions for, well, what do we do with this from a conservation standpoint? <clears throat> so my research has essentially 
the only sources of ecological novelty that sort of, in my opinion, for all practical intents and purposes, are essentially here to stay. Uh, this includes exotic earthworms, which we'll introduce in a second, uh, but I also work with a number of pest caterpillar species as well, uh, which we'll be talking about today. The question I try and ask, or and I can try and answer, is essentially, well, what do you do when you can't do anything else? The answer I try and work towards is that you try and learn to live with, and in our case, more specifically, restore or conserve with these species ecological effects present. <coughs> so what do these species really mean for managing and restoring ecosystems that have specifically been invaded and have these uh, effects as a part of how they operate? Is trying to avoid the all too common pathway which occurs by prevention control is the first step that you're trying to achieve, but when it's not feasible, you just sort of don't have anything be done and it kind of ends up being ignored. The issue here is that you're ignoring something that is very much present and very much having effect. These can be critical components of the ecosystems and how they operate, and by ignoring them, simply as you sort of basically don't want them to be there but can't get rid of them, um, your abilities to manage those systems are going to be severely limited. So integrate is essentially an alternate pathway uh, where we understand these novel interactions that are occurring following invasion and integrate those into management. And this pathway is so essentially you're trying to recognize, capitalize on beneficial effects from the species, and also recognizing and trying to mitigate undesirable impacts at the same time. The case of novelty that we're working with today and that I've been working with for the past six or seven years now uh, are exotic earthworms. These species that are a part of a global invasion process, there are over 6,000 species globally. And exotics are represented on every continent of the world with one exception of Antarctica. In America specifically, our native earthworms were wiped out uh, quite a while back by glaciation. Uh, there are a few remnants, but they're very really poorly represented. And the vast majority of what you'll see in this garden, in your fields, and in our forests are exotic, primarily European species. Nest invasions, the primary focus here has historically been control and prevention of the invasion. Uh, but this has been limited by a few issues, uh, notwithstanding the fact that we don't have a good way to control or prevent the invasion. Um, so in my opinion, and the opinion of, of I think, a growing number of people, these uh, earth are not, they're not really going anywhere. Uh, they're continuing to spread, and so their, their presence as an exotic invasive is just going to become more and more common over time. Um, let's see, there we go. Uh, this is second in this case because Earth are what we call ecosystem engineers. Uh, that's to say they have disproportionate biotic and abiotic impacts on the habitats that they live in, in our case, the habitats that they arrive in and start to change. Now, this is for the IIPC, so we're talking about plants today most uh, uh, significantly. Infant plants can come from two different sources. You can have indirect effects. Uh, largely, this has to do with altering the soil environment, which then in turn affects the plant community. Uh, there are also a number of well understood direct effects, whereby earthworms are interacting more directly with the plants themselves. Earthworm impacts can be beneficial to some plant species, and they can be negative to others. As a result of this, you can have fairly large scale shifts in your plant community that are complex and difficult to predict. We're going to start out with a quick run through, fairly general look at some of these potential earthworm uh, impacts on plants. Uh, through these effects. So we start with indirect effects. Plant communities, of course, depend on the soil as an environment. It provides structural support, temperature regulation, nutrients, water, various other things. Uh, and at the end of the day, earthworms can come in and really change these conditions quite permanently. Really obvious impacts that you'll see following an earthworm invasion are changes on the soil structure. Uh, I've got images from a few um, structures that you'll see that you can just sort of visibly um, following invasion. You can have uh, burrows, depending on the species, you can have burrows that are up to you know, three meters down into the ground, fairly large diameter. You can hang at the, at the surface in some cases. Uh, in the middle, we have what's called a midden. This is essentially a, a sort of combination front door and larder that's aided by uh, gathering up largely organic materials from the surface, uh, and it gets aggregated and placed on top of the earthworm burrow, so you can sort of see that coming down the, the center there. And so you'll often see these dotting the forest floor, for example, that's essentially the top of, a, of an earthworm burrow, types of species. You have casts on the far right here. So this is the waste material that can be exceeded 
again, depending on the, the species, you can occur below ground or it can occur on the soil surface as well. So you have this material being brought up from below the ground. Um, the less visually obvious soil structure changes occur below ground, of course. Um, generally speaking, earthworms function as decomposers, and some species have a profound impact on the of organic matter into the soil. Uh, so what you'll see very quickly following invasion in many cases is a gradual or a fairly rapid disappearance of the organic horizon in the soil and a general increase in soil homogeneity. So soil uh, horizons that you saw in that profile sort of start to become uh, less discrete and you get this organic matter mixing in uh, fairly quickly. And there are various impacts on, on things like soil hydrology, aeration, bulk density, temperature. Uh, seedling protection is a big one because you have this leaf litter there on top that is being abated and removed. So that's just protection for seedlings that are growing there, and so on. Obvious, again, are some of the impacts on soil microbes. I'd say these are some of the ones that uh, it's one of the best areas for continuing research. Um, generally speaking, earthworm guts, casts, burrows are all, all potential hotspots of microbial life. I can have greater or reduced diversity or abundance, unique species. Um, speaking, what happens is you have an acceleration of the breakdown of organic matter. Um, but you can also have uh, direct physical impacts as well on these microbes. Um, one of the cases that comes up as one of the more interesting ones is potential disruptions to fungal network in the soil. Extensions from uh, plant roots that help with nutrient acquisition can be damaged by uh, the burrowing activity or the grazing directly feeding on them from certain earthworm species. And this can have interesting implications for species that are dependent on these mycorrhizal associations. And we'll be coming back to that a little bit later in one of the case studies. Earthworm invasion can, of course, also change the availability of different soil nutrients. Happily speaking, these are decomposer species. Uh, you generally see an increase in the short-term availability of nutrients like nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, calcium, magnesium, and a few others. This is sort of one of the reasons why, although we talk about earthworms as being a generally negative uh, ecological feature in a lot of our uh, established forests, they're generally a positive thing to have in your garden or an agricultural field where you have uh, plants that are able to take up those very quickly liberated nutrients and, and put them to good use on more long-term dynamics can depend on castability and are a little bit more variable. So earthworm cast, the, the waste material that's being produced is, is very stable by virtue of the soil properties, ambient conditions in terms of moisture and whatnot. It can become a very stable, nice source of slow-release nutrients which benefits the plants. Um, on the other hand, if the casts are very unstable, so they fall apart, they crumble, they're susceptible to just a lot of um, a lot of moisture, you can have accelerated uh, leaching of these nutrients, resulting in a net export away from uh, the stem and sauce. Um, so those are some of the indirect effects, uh, and they're probably what receives the bulk of the attention. Uh, more recently, however, we're seeing uh, additional research looking at direct interactions of earthworms and plants. Um, and this is a component of the work that I've been doing over the past several years, specifically looking at earthworms and seeds. Um, so sort of a surprise initially, but uh, more and more often we're having documentation of earthworms acting as granivores. So they actually go around in the soil or on the soil surface and consume, uh, ingest, consume, eat. Uh, a lot of these species, they generally have a crop and a gizzard, a lot like a bird or dinosaur. They can have ability to break down this material and consume it and gain nutrition from it. One of this is really interesting and has some um, ecological outcomes is the fact that this seed collection is selective. Uh, they're key. They're choosy about which seeds they're going to go after, whether on the surface or below ground. And then map onto seed traits like the size of the seed, how much oil is in it, uh, external uh, soil structures there are, and whatnot. So they'll prefer to go after certain seeds over others. Seed has been ingested and consumed by an earth. Firm. Uh, there are various fights that can await them. Seed can be digested, so it's destroyed, it's assumed, assimilated uh, into the earthworm body, and it's gone. Um, or, uh, on the cases that the seeds actually do survive the earthworm gut, sort of a more sturdy seed, often makes it back through and is egested or put out into the soil. 
uh, it can have a number of different outcomes. Um, so that we look at our uh, potential increases or decreases to germination or seed viability. Um, or egested, so they've consumed seed, they've pooped it back out, um, or when they go around and collect seed that is maybe too big for them to consume, uh, they'll actually cache them. So this can be done into the midden, so sort of that structure on top of the soil surface, or it can be pulled down below ground, uh, basically to be eaten later once it's decomposed a little bit and is easier to consume. Um, and so in this fashion, earthworms actually function not only as granivores, but also as seed dispersers, uh, like a lot of rodents and birds. So then either they can move seeds vertically up or down. Uh, they can bury seed deeper in the soil, or they carry seed that's already been buried back up to the surface. And so in this way, they're actually contributing to uh, and making seed from the seed bank. So they're interacting with that very directly. Serial interactions can have very complex trade-offs for seeds. For example, if you have a seed that's on the surface just lying there, it's quite vulnerable to drying out, so desiccation, by being consumed by other granivores that are going to walk along and eat it. Uh, and so being moved to the ground by an earthworm can offer a benefit to those seeds. And most seeds have an emergent step. They have uh, a point in the soil at which if they're buried past that point, they're just not going to germinate, or they will try to germinate, run out of gas, uh, not make it to the surface, and, and die off. So that can be a problem. So you have beneficial effects, negative effects, and ultimately, a trade-off from seed burial. Moving into even more obscure territory, there have been a few documented issues of earthworms acting as herbivores of green uh, non-seed plant tissue as well. So feeding on leaves, feeding on seedlings, feeding on roots. This is not a photo that I took, but definitely one of my favorites is how often do you see uh, earthworm reach up and just sort of take a bite off of a plant. Uh, it has been documented to happen. The actions are interesting because unlike for seeds, ingestion of a, a leaf or a seedling is nearly always fatal. So a seed can pass through the gut, a seedling doesn't fare as well, generally speaking. The seeds, there seem to be bases for uh, preference of herbivory. Um, so in general, material that seems to be more rich in nitrogen, so uh, legume species over grass species, or different stages of, of um, uh, seeds seem to be preferred largely based on size. One of the other outcomes from this seems to be that, that a seed that grows into a seedling that grows into a larger plant faster will have a much narrower window of time in which it is vulnerable to this seedling herbivory, as if it's from the size refuge from growing quickly. Uh, so that'll favor these, these growing, uh, fast growing species. We have these indirect effects, we have these direct effects. In several cases of earthworms, to be positively associated with densities of exotic plants. And this has especially been in forests. So you go around, you sample plots, you find, oh, the plots have the higher densities of earthworms, exotic earthworms tend to also have higher densities of exotic plants. And there's been a lot of speculation as to what's causing this interaction, what's causing this pattern. Um, so speculation has been built around removing that litter layer has been a big part of it, making it easier for invasive plants to get in and establish themselves. Uh, as we mentioned before, accelerating the whole sequence of nutrient cycling such that nutrients, uh, organic matter is breaking down faster. We have nutrients available at a given time, uh, which in this rich environment, a lot of basic plants will thrive in that, whereas natives can't quite use it as effectively. Um, construction of roots and, and huffy and whatnot. Uh, this altered environment species over natives adapted to prior conditions. That's sort of the thinking on this. Um, it's worth really considering at this point the fact that the vast majority of these studies, if not on all of them, are correlative and not causal, uh, which is a you know, big principle uh, when we're doing science like this is to really consider <coughs> what is the actual mechanism here. And in these cases, it's not clear. So in the case that exotic earthworms are in fact helping out exotic plants, they do better when they're present. Maybe plants help out the earthworms as well. Equally likely, or it's just as possible, I should say, the one or other confounding factors that are driving the interactions. There may be something else like human disturbance, which tends to favor earthworms and exotic plants. We don't really in most of these cases. 
Uh, what we need is more specific experimental ecological research to try and really figure this out. So the day, the effects of these earthworms on plants are very difficult to generalize, and generalizing about them can be quite dangerous. Generally, what you're looking at is a net impact of a mix of uh, specific interactions or sub-interactions that may individually be positive or negative and have various trade-offs come towards some sort of net impact in a given case. As a result of these net impacts, some plants do better when your returns are present, and some less as well. And so the approach is to studying these plant interactions is doing so on a very contextual, case-by-case -case basis. Uh, so we're going to go through a few of those cases now. Uh, we're going to start with uh, uh, first two are ones that I was not not directly done any research with myself. This is just reporting other cases in the literature, and then the third I've been in with uh, in capacity at least a number of years ago. So we're going to start off with giant ragweed. Now this is a thick species, but it is a weedy species that is native to North America. This is Ambrosia trifida. Um, some of the traits that help it do well as it has include a very early emergence in the season, rapid growth, large size, uh, large tough seeds, and a fairly beefy chemical resistance, which makes it difficult to get rid of. From a standpoint, it can be detrimental to crop yields and also functions as an unpleasant human allergen for a lot of people. Now, a few others, including the ones noted here, uh, have suggested that earthworms may function as facilitators on rag. Specifically, exotic earthworms in these cases. This interaction is thought to be based on ragweed seeds. Uh, these that are fairly large, so they have an image of these spiky seeds here that can be up to 14 millimeters long. Um, and because they're such a uh, nutrient rich little package, they suffer from very high predation from birds, rodents, beetles, and other sources. Now, the ways that they're able to deal with this is uh, that they, they end up buried. Seeds can emerge from up to 10 centimeters deep in the soil. They're fairly large, so they have a lot of resources to get back up to the surface. And so systems where they're able to get below ground and gain protection from these predators, um, they, they, they one of the circumstances that create this in crop fields where you have tillage. So the, the tillage incorporates the seeds into the soil. They're protected from granivory, and it tends to do quite well. Was looking, we're looking at were cases where giant ragweed was being all successful, uh, even in agricultural fields that didn't have this tillage to protect it from this high surface ground every. So they're thinking, okay, what's maybe going on here? Found over the course of the research that giant ragweed was very often found to co occur with exotic earthworms. Um, <clears throat> this isn't really surprising in many ways, giant ragweed. As big agricultural weed, exotic earthworms tend to do very well and be found commonly and in high densities in agricultural field, uh, but they did to be f seem to be fairly strongly linked. What's interesting was in this case, these seeds were generally too large for earthworms to consume. Uh, so for the larger species like uh, Lumbricus terrestris, which I've done a lot of work with, that's uh, commonly known as a nightcrawler earthworm, or dewworm, popular uh, bait earthworm, if anyone is fishing. Um, there larger species that we have here, and it's generally thought if something's larger than two millimeters wide, they're going to have trouble getting that into their mouth and consuming it. Um, so these seeds weren't really great eating. What meant was this particular earthworm, Lumbricus terrestris, is going around, uh, coming out of its burrow. You can see the anterior, or posterior end, rather, still low ground. The head pops up and grabs seeds on the surface and does eat them, but does drag them back to the to their burrow. Uh, and these seeds were either ending up uh, below ground or if they didn't fit through the burrow because they were too wide, they would generally end up sort of stocked and can the midden, which you can see in the photo on the uh, right side there. They did an experiment just in, in mesosomes that 90% of the ragweed seeds that they would place on the surface in the presence of earthworms uh, removed within 20 days, which is quite rapid. So within three weeks, most of these seeds at a fairly high seeding density uh, were, were, were removed. Now, we said how burial has negative impacts on uh, the plant seeds and on the, the plant species. Uh, some of these are going to be buried too deeply, some are going to be edged, pathogens are going to get at them, some of the smaller seeds might actually, they might actually be able to swallow and consume. And so in this case, they did see 
the reduction in seedling recruitment of 37% when it was just earthworms and seeds. However, they found that when you throw other granivores into the mix, so in a sort of a natural field setting, the impact on recruitment was positive and beneficial. The trade-off between losing the seeds to be being, being buried too deeply, being damaged, being consumed, uh, but in the wash favorable for ragweed, because the protection they were getting from the much more intense uh, uh, above ground occurring. So smashing the seeds, they were protecting them from other granivores, and sort of an added bonus to the giant ragweed, seeds that were grown in association with earthworm middens and burrows actually had increased biomass of about 30%, presumably due to the availability of uh, larger concentrations of nutrients in the, uh, the earthworm burrows. And overall, earth turned out to be a key promoter of the weedy behavior of these species, especially in these no-till fields. They're helping them do well in situations that they, they otherwise would have some trouble with. Suggested at the end of the day that additional control measures for giant weed would probably be necessary in uh, systems where you're dealing with higher earthworm densities. So, considering exotic earthworms as facilitators of weedy species becomes an important part of the management approach to dealing with uh, this, this weedy species. Okay, so the second case here is a uh, common or European buckthorn. This is Ramnus cathartica. It's a uh, noxious exotic weed native to Europe, likely introduced into North America in the 1880s as an ornamental and windbreak species. Uh, it has up its sleeve is a very leaf out, early leaf out, uh, and retains that vegetation late into the season, so it's growing for a long time. It produces a very high quantity of very readily dispersed seed that's made and drought tolerant, uh, and as a result of this, ends up being very highly competitive. Tends to farm dense patches that can reduce biodiversity locally and harbor various agricultural pests and pathogens. So, so something that we generally don't want around in high, high abundances. But like with the giant ragweed case, cawthorn and exotic earthworms have been found to co-occur throughout America. And this is based on uh, several bodies of research that you can look up and I can provide references for that at a later time if you're interested. Um, Often the case with these, the causal mechanisms underlying these potential associations are um, What these authors have suggested is occurring is a positive feedback cycle whereby exotic earthworms help the buckthorn, buckthorn helps earthworms, um, that is based primarily on soil chemistry. Uh, what they're sort of speculating is that earthworms are helping out buckthorn by removing litter, um, decomposing this material very quickly, uh, increasing immediate nutrient availability, which the buckthorn is able to use and grow rapidly as it invades the system. And buckthorn, in turn, actually helps out the earthworm as well, uh, potentially by acting preferred soil conditions, so the, the moisture and the pH that you get under buckthorn is sort of giant for earthworms, it seems, for a lot of these species, uh, also by creating a very highly palatable litter. Um, leaf litter is a major constituent of the diet of most of our earthworm species that we have here. Uh, so vegetation that has fallen from trees, dry but much of their diet. It seems like buckthorn leaves are particularly tasty and nutritive to uh, various exotic earthworms. So both uh, win and collectively they do quite well. What I found is when they conducted a removal experiment, they took them and they took buckthorn out of half the plots. Um, abundance was reduced by 50%. So there's a fairly large decrease in the number, just the density of earthworms that were in these plots. So sort of a way to help get rid of earthworms, maybe, to a certain extent, uh, but also it did suggest that one was benefiting from the other. The reciprocal impacts of earthworm removal on buckthorn um, success are unknown. It's sort of an interesting thing to wonder about. Pull turns away, does the buckthorn do less well? Uh, but again, come back to that issue of not really having any good practical control options for dealing with the earthworms. So maybe you could do this on a plot level, but on a large scale, this is not really practical in my opinion. This served as a reminder of, however, was the fact that even when earthworms were reduced or just locally absent, they can continue to exert various legacy effects, particularly on soil chemistry, but also soil structure. They can help facilitate barn or other species. So even if you did have a way to get rid of them, not physically, but at that time, 
they're still having an impact on, on those bees. A message from this one, uh, I said it came out that common buckthorn invasion is likely to be more successful and unfortunately more difficult to control when earthworms are present if there is some sort of uh, positive feedback association happening here. The third case to look at here is uh, garlic mustard. And this is sort of an old favorite and, and one that I actually have been involved with, although not recently. This is now a number of years ago. Garlic mustard, or Aliaria pedialata, probably quite familiar to people here, is biennial forb, native to Western Eurasia. It's often brought over to North America around 18, the 1860s. Uh, primarily a medicinal plant, but also something that you can eat. Uh, highly aggressive, very adaptable, invader of, of largely forest understories. A wide, impressive range, uh, arsenal of tricks, uh, including ca chemical allopathy, barely growth, very high seed production, and, and so on. Animal uh, does uh, quite well upon invading. Same story, abundances of exotic earthworms and garlic mustard found to be positively graded in American forests. This has been documented in a few locations. Uh, and yet again, you have thought there's a mutualism happening here, but mechanisms are largely unclear. Um, so the suspicion is that firms are helping out garlic mustard. Garlic mustard helps out uh, firms in return favor. Not that earthworms are, again, removing litter, making invasion easier. Uh, but also the more sort of unique case of this is the disruption of fungal hyphae. Um, so we mentioned this before, uh, burrowing and grazing of earthworms resulting in the destruction of these fungal hyphae that help a lot of our native plants of our nutrients. Garlic mustard not dependent on these in the same way, and in fact seems to target them chemically as well on its own. So sort of a double whammy for an environment where it's even more competitive. Uh, in terms of what garlic mustard is doing for earthworms, if anything, uh, potentially providing favorable soil alteration, like, like with the butthorn, but uh, this hasn't really been uh, looked at very well. Um, I got into a project a number of years ago looking at uh, this earthworm garlic mustard association is something that was quite interesting to look at. Um, and I took a completely different part of this interaction that hadn't really been considered, uh, which was seeds. Uh, from seed interactions were sort of a new thing. Uh, just trying to get the basic ecology of how earthworms interact with seeds. This looked like a potentially good system to examine that in. Third seeds have been observed to be highly palatable and preferred by earthworms in a number of different studies, including some done by our, our host, Colin, in the past. Uh, you can see them on the right here. These are fairly small, smooth. Uh, I guess if you're an earthworm for tasty looking seeds, uh, that have been found to be consumed in, in large numbers. Uh, early research was built around this question of how do earthworms impact garlic mustard, uh, specifically through interactions with the seeds. I want to take this and break it down into various different components. Take a look at here at some of the, the, the experimental tools that you can actually start to use to develop some of those uh, mechanisms that underlie these interactions. Um, so one of the tools that I've used over the years, these are cafeteria experiments, uh, specifically their uh, no, no choice feeding experiments uh, where you're offering earthworm seeds of different species or mixes of species uh, in a petri dish environment. You give individual worms a fast period, you introduce a fixed quantity of seed into one of these dishes, uh, in case you're giving them an 18 hour feeding window, uh, and then you remove the Earthworms. You know how many seeds you put in, you see how many are left, so by difference you can determine they were consumed. Uh, and transfer them to a, a fresh dish, you leave for 48 hours to see what they, they poop out. So you get to search that and do account to see how many seeds were ingested and what was missing was presumably during that period of time digested and consumed by the earthworm. With garlic mustard seeds, uh, so sort of the, the big finding is that if you throw 50 seeds in an earthworm, uh, this was Lumbricus terrestris, our big uh, deep growing species again, 50 seeds at them in an 18 hour period, uh, seed ingestion was quite high. So 66% of seeds and 33 are actually being consumed. Of those, 20% were being uh, digested and destroyed. So, uh, but even more were actually being egested intact back out into. In this is the dish, but in a natural setting, it would be into the soil or into the mid-in. 
to follow up by looking at, well, what is the condition of those seeds? What happens to those seeds? He says there are effects on germination. Seed germination can, can be boosted. It can be overall viability. can be impaired by damage incurred through the gut. Essentially took uh, groups of seeds, put them on a gibberellic acid growth medium, um, and then just waited to see how many actually germinated. So we had intact control garlic mustard seeds. We had seeds that had been scarified man manually. So the species that needs to overwinter, uh, which produces cracks in the seed coat, allows them to germinate the next year. Um, you can simulate this by uh, just using sandpaper, basically. Um, and so when you do that, you get very high germination. And then looked at the seeds that we collected out the back end of the earthworm and saw no impacts on seed germination. So they like control conditions, like they scarified, nothing really changed. And they were still viable. So some impact here. Um, we did take those adjusted seeds, however, and also look at them uh, individually under a dissecting microscope um, to look for potential damage to the seed coats, um, just from chemical and, and physical digestive properties. These were assigned uh, qualitatively to one of three damage classes or categories. Um, so 36 of them, percent of them, fell into this class one, which is essentially no damage. They just kind of look they did when they went in. Six percent were in this class two, where there was some moderate abrasion. They were sort of scuffed up. Um, something had quickly changed. Uh, Eight percent were in this third damage class, where, where large uh, patches of the seed coat have been stripped off, and there's potentially a lot of damage, but it's still recognizable as a seed. Well, 64 percent, more than half of the seeds, disdained visible damage to the seed coat. Um, it was sort of interesting that this wasn't quite enough to stimulate germination from these seeds, uh, but in cases where bits of the seed coat had been pulled off, we sort of speculated as potential for an increase in pathogen susceptibility uh, and then subsequent seed death in the soil if this were in a more uh, naturalistic sort of setting. That specifically. One of the more complicated elements of these earthworm seed interactions are again looking at the seed bale. Um, so the first thing that we did here was look at the ability of garlic mustard seeds to emerge from different depths. So we took a group of scarified seeds, so these are ones we're going to germinate uh, and sow them at different depths in these vertical soil mesocosms, so on the surface and different depths below the, sur below the surface. A number of weeks, and we're monitoring emergence at the surface of these seedlings. Essentially, what we found was that emergence decreased very dramatically for seeds that were buried even fairly shallowly. So once you're below three, eight centimeters, uh, those seeds aren't able to make it to the surface. Has to be pretty pretty close to the top to to do well. So we do a specific follow up at that time for a number of largely boring logistical reasons. In recent years, I've done some more work uh, at earthworm seed interactions. Uh, with the somewhat uh, more boring but easier to work with gravity is sort of a model sea organism, um, and I've since done some experiments to track where earthworms are actually burying seeds. Uh, that they act at the soil surface, where they end up, up below ground. Uh, so these are some 3D scatter plots. Push these up, make them look a little nicer in the future. Uh, but if you imagine these sitting inside of a uh, PVC cylinder about 15 centimeters in diameter, um, they stretch down in, in these images about 12, 13 centimeters in depth. So each of those dots marks the location of a seed, a grass seed, that was picked up by an earthworm at the soil surface and buried below ground. Uh, and so if you take all the seeds at a given depth, you sort of find the centroid, you draw a line between the centroids vertically down, you can actually start to pretty clearly see where some of these earthworm burrows probably lay and uh, where these seeds were being cast just alongside of the burrow. This grass seed experiment we found was that uh, quite a bit of the seed was buried fairly deeply in the soil. And these are similarly sized seeds, so we'd imagine that something comparable was happening with the garlic mustard as well. So the seed we saw, 72% of the seed buried at least five centimeters deep or deeper. Expect that the seed burial is probably having in the field a fairly negative impact on uh, garlic mustard emergence. A lot of it's going to be buried quite deeply. Uh, yes, you're making a seed bank, but at the same time, if they're sort of scuffed up, pathogens are going to get at them. Uh, if they try and germinate, they're going to die because they're too deep in the soil. So probably, on balance, a, a negative impact of mixed. a very 
initial look at this, so we're just sort of getting started out with it. Um, <clears throat> but essentially, we were working from the speculated uh, mutualism between these two species that's based on some maybe mechanisms that are occurring, uh, based on just visual observations and sampling that suggested a co-association. In our case, when we looked just at these earthworm seed interactions, we saw evidence of primarily negative uh, earthworm seed interaction effects from the garlic mustard standpoint. Okay. The day these interactions have all these different components and subcomponents to them. So if we take just the seed component, we can unpack that further, and we get things like seed digestion. We'll tell probably they're digesting a bunch of the seeds. That's going to have a negative effect. Seed duration didn't seem to really matter in that case, so this was fairly neutral. Material could be variable from negative to neutral to positive. In this case, I'm suspecting it's largely kind of negative. And by some uh, sort of qualitative summing here, you can see the interaction that's, that's largely negative on balance. But one thing to remember here is that these trade-offs are very, very contextual. Uh, one thing that really showcases this is, uh, again, another uh, tangent here. <clears throat> this is from an exposure experiment that I did um, a couple of years ago now, or about a year ago. How Earth granivory interacts with granivory from other sources. Uh, so these were plots that were set up outside in a field um, and used exposures to control the access of other granivores to the plots. So we had uh, grass seeds sown in these at the surface, control treatment where no one could get at it. We were expecting highest uh, growth from this one, and various levels of granivore access. So earthworms alone, species like uh, birds and rodents getting at them, and Everyone there with the earthworms and other species. Look at what happened here in terms of grass biomass relative to the granivore free control. Recent levels of reduction. Uh, <clears throat> so when earthworms were present on their own, they had a 22% uh, reduction in biomass on average. Um, the impact of the other granivores was much larger. It's about 83% on average. So they moved more of the seeds, reduced the growth from that. What was interesting was our earthworm effects sort of appeared within this other granivore effect uh, when they were all there together. It was basically indistinguishable from um, when it's the other species and not earthworms. You throw them in, there wasn't really any change. Uh, and this has been observed in at least one other study. This is one that Colin actually did as well uh, in forests, similar effect here, uh, whereby this earthworm, effect, when you throw it in with other granivores, it just sort of blends the mix. And there are very possible reasons for this. Uh, it could just be that the, the earthworm granivory is, is slower acting. They just don't get it as quickly. You could say that maybe the presence of some of these other species that would also happily eat earthworms, for example, and do some sort of behavioral response whereby foraging from the earthworms is reduced. Um, this is uh, a really sort of interesting thing to look at in more depth. It broadly suggests here is that the impact of the earthworms depends on the relative uh, relative presence of earthworms versus other species as granivores in a system. The earthworms were there on their own. They still had a fairly uh, a noticeable uh, impact on the growth from the seed. It just appeared when the other granivores were much more abundant. So it's really going to vary from case to case. So there are three hypothetical forests here. They all have earthworms. They all have gar garlic mustard in them. Um, and we're just looking at what's the direction of this earthworm seed impact. Uh, from garlic mustard's perspective. So we have a situation where, let's say, garlic mustard just got here, very small population, very low number of seeds, um, lots of earthworms. Say that the granivory impacts and the burial impacts are on balance going to have a negative impact on the seeds because there's just not that many of them. So the population doesn't really have a chance to get going. We have this with a different forest. Say we have garlic mustard, we have earthworms, but we have another plant species that is producing seeds that are actually uh, more palatable than the garlic mustard seeds. So given a choice between them, they'll go after this other species first. Um, in this case, the pressure shifts off of the garlic mustard seeds, and the seed impact is probably uh, fairly neutral. They're probably, or pretend, not even interacting with them at all. Look still another forest where we have garlic mustard, we have earthworms, but we also have uh, a very abundant surface granivores, so you have squirrels or something, squirrels everywhere. Uh, in this case, um, the, so the impact could, could potentially be positive, depending on the level of granivory pressure from other sources. 
Um, yes, earthworms are still consuming the seeds, but it may be that the burial effect that comes with that on balance, like with our ragweed case, exerts a net positive impact. A textual and difficult to judge from case to case. We're going to close up with just a few general thoughts here <clears> about <throat> the implications of these interactions for recreation. Um, the point I've been trying to get across today is the fact that these impacts uh, of earthworms on exotic or native plants as well are they're complex, they're syncretic, they're very difficult to generalize and, and dangerous to generalize, I would say, as well. The impacts always represent a complex balance of both beneficial and dental interactions or sub-interactions, which donates and what creates a net negative or positive impact will vary from case to case. So because interactions vary, it also suggests that the best management approaches are all going to vary case by case. So in situations, for example, when earthworm impacts on exotic plants are primarily beneficial, their ragweed, maybe our buckthorn, or they're helping out, uh, it may need you may need to increase control efforts when earthworms are present because we uh, there is this additional force that is helping them out in these cases essentially. Impacts are primarily detrimental, however, earthworm present can actually in management prospects. That actually may be a, a, an assisting force in this case. In both situations, however, what is important and to recognize that it is important to use management tools that are complementary to whatever the effect is. Um, so if they are helping out uh, you want and you're trying to target uh, a given exotic plant, then using tools that account for the ways in which they are helping uh, is, is what you want to do. Similarly, if they're actually in you by having a detrimental impact, you want to make sure that whatever you're doing to control the invasion is interfering with their effect and is, in fact, maybe taking less advantage of it. So in the little intro pitch there, it was mentioned um, that uh, earthworms and seeds and plants is actually uh, a small corner of my overall thesis work. I was more broadly looking at, at exotics, uh, earth specifically, and restoration. If the interactions with an amendment, seeds is one of them, also mulch and wood. Um, and looking at how earthworms impact those and how these tools can be used effectively in systems that have been invaded by earthworms. Uh, so it boils down to this three-step process whereby if you're managing one of these systems with, with um, say, exotic ecosystem engineering earthworms present, you figure out what novelty is present, you know, are there, what species, what abundance, then the impacts that they're having, impacts that are relevant to your measurement of that particular system. So for example, <clears throat> uh, with our wood ash experiments, uh, just as an example, this is an amendment that you put on top of the soil surface um, to try and uh, modify pH and nutrient enrichment in desirable ways. Um, it looks like uh, exotic earthworms can actually be helpful this material below ground. Uh, and so you're putting the, the, the ash down on leaf litter that then gets incorporated down into the soil by some of these leaf-bearing earthworms, and they actually help mix it into the soil, which can be very difficult to do if you're in a forest, for example. And so understand that as a new impact that is now in this system. And follow-up step to that, you use new information that you have to modify how you're managing that system. So in the case of the wood ash example, <coughs> uh, if you're counting on them to help you mix it into the soil, you don't use a ash type that is detrimental to their survival. I'm not going to kill them off. Uh, they're very sensitive to changes in pH and things like that. So use something that complements this beneficial effect. Whether they're doing something that for perspective is good or bad, you adjust management to maximize these complementary effects and mitigate the undesirable ones. And that applies in the seed and, and plant situation just as much. For me, this all is a reminder of at the end of the day is the fact that the impacts of these exotic species and novelty more broadly, and how to manage them are, again, always very contextual. It depends on what the species are changing. It depends on what your restoration and conservation goals are, and it depends on how those questions line up. So depending on the things, the impacts of any of these um, species can contextually range from detrimental to neutral to beneficial. And if you fall on that spectrum, will in turn dictate the preferred management responses. If it's a detrimental effect, removal and mitigation can be high priority. 
where if it's actually doing something useful, that's something you want to enhance and take advantage of through your own uh, management. So uh, just at the very end of the day here, some general recommendations in terms of the, the interactions of exotic growth from exotic plants. I think suggest some very general recommendations for invasion science and conservation. And the big one, which I've reiterated a few times here today, is just the big generalizations, right? Getting interactions on a case-by-case -case basis while less appealing in terms of making broad level planning and policy that is just easier to implement um, is often the way that it needs to be done just because these things are quite complex uh, and will just vary so widely. Relatedly, it's important always to distinguish between correlation, correlation and causation. Again, this is one of those cases where developing these causal mystic understandings is uh, unfortunately, more work in most cases, uh, but also quite informative, and and especially when you're trying to plan out how to manage this specifically, uh, really understanding what's going on beyond just the interact uh, can be very instructive. At the end of the day, just always recognizing the fact that these ecosystems are very dynamic, especially with humans present. We really make things even more changeable, more complex. Um, Realizing that as human global influence continues to spread and mix species around, novel species interactions are just going to become more and more common. Um, understanding that things are changing, what's on, what's different, and what needs to be done differently from an adaptive management standpoint also becomes very important to have the most effective and efficient conservation and restoration uh, outcomes possible. The end of my slides there. Thank you very much, everyone, for listening. A lot of people have certainly supported this work over the years. Uh, big thank you to OIPC for having me out today. And uh, I think I'm, we're going to be doing some questions here. So I think we're handing it back to Colin to uh, moderate this. Uh, thanks very much, Michael. I think everyone will be able to hear now, I hope. Uh, but we've got a few questions that have come in already. Uh, just as a quick reminder, if you do have any other questions you'd like to um, be pitched to Michael, please <coughs> chat box on the right. Um, Michael, I've got you unmuted, and I'm unmuted here. I hope. Um, so I'm going to uh, pitch a couple that have come in so far here. Um, so it looks like the first one here, somebody's just asking for, I guess, a, a bit of context. Um, asking, I guess, like, how, how abundant are earthworms? Is it unusual for in Ontario forests to come across earthworms? Um, so maybe some perspectives from your field work. Like, how hard is it to find a control site without earthworms present? Right. Yeah. No. That's fair. Um, general rule from it, I think, is that when you're when you really need to find them and and it's important that you do so, that's that's when you don't. I think I'm always amazed by it's a the thing to emphasize here is how patchy I think the invasion is. There are large areas uh, where you know you'd be very hard pressed not to find uh, species, and then others where um, just there are large patches where there's nothing going on. The important thing to remember about this dispersal is that there. Um, their active dispersal of themselves, them just moving around in response to population pressures or whatever, is very slow. You know, are not fast-moving species. What's around quickly are humans. So when uh, someone dumps a bunch of fishing bait into the woods, they have a new population that got driven there potentially quite a large distance, and then they tend to spread out very slowly from there. Um, tend to have these pockets that are slowly growing, and eventually, if you're in a very a densely traveled area, they'll sort of run into each other such that it's more continuous, uh, like very low-lying, very wet areas. Uh, very poor ration, you'll tend to have low densities. Um, and there's a sort of latitudinal pattern to this as well. Generally speaking, the further north that you go, the number of species that possess the cold tolerance to deal with that are fewer and far between, and so the overall density or, or just diversity tends to drop off as well. Though that pretty far north as well, uh, certain species are fairly good at dealing with it. So it, it's quite patchy and certainly related to human habitation and human land use. It's very strongly tied. Uh, the closer you are to where people are, the higher density uh, and diversity you're, you're generally going to see. So those are pathways are listed off there. Um, we're talking about bait and kind of human disturbance being a pathway. I guess um, Contaminated soil and fill would also be another decent one as well, right? I guess moving soil and, and aggregates around? Yep, I, I think uh, for people who aren't aware, earthworms do produce uh, cocoons that the babies come out of. So these are fairly resilient, fairly small structures 
that can travel uh, in unseen in soil and, and potted agricultural or conduction material. They can also fit into the treads of shoes or, uh, or vehicles and be moved around in, in that manner as well. So again, very tightly to, to human activities. So we've got a, a couple asking about this, so maybe could you just expand a little bit on um, the native versus non-native aspect of, like, how many native earthworms do we have, how many exotics do we have? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. People just yeah. missed it off the top. Uh, yeah, well, I, I think you'd probably good for this as well. I I think the last number, the taxonomy of this is, is not something that I've been too strongly invested in, and, and I know it's continuing to change. Uh, the number that sort of comes to mind offhand for Canada, broadly speaking, is 27 species total, 19 of which are exotic, was sort of the, that I recall. Uh, I think onto 17 and 19, uh, something like that. The trick with the native species is that uh, because most of them were moved by glaciation, the ones that are left are essentially the ones that were able to dodge that. So like with a lot of other post-glacial species, these are uh, organisms that survived in refugia that weren't as strongly affected and to be coastal. I know there are some on the west coast. Uh, there are also some that just live in much more marginal environments like, like sort of arctic earthworms rather than terrestrial earthworms or a few of the species. Um, so these are species that have been documented once or twice, and they sort of they make the list, but they're not, they're not very common at all, broadly speaking. The vast majority, certainly in Ontario, are um, exotic species. Yeah, I think that's great. And the 17 of 19 is the number I always use come across as well for for Ontario specific. So 17 being exotic uh, and two being native. And then just to echo your point there, I mean, it's really the, the common, when we all think collectively of, of interactions with earthworms, those are the ones we're talking about that fit into the 17. So mm -hmm. as they, like those two, unless you've got the waves on and you're out there doing some benthic sampling, you're, and you know, every time we're talking about earthworms on a sidewalk, earthworm garden, we're pretty much talking about that, those 17 collective species, not the two natives. And of those 17s, there, there are definitely three or four, you know, I could name off the top of my head, that are much more strongly represented than the others as well. There's a few very common species, and then a number of sort of intermediate and some, some recent there as well. Um, so, Michael, someone here is asking about uh, sampling for earthworms. I'm not sure if that's within the scope of some of your research, but um, did you want to talk about how you might go about finding earthworms, finding out if you do have? Uh, yeah, sure, of course, yeah. So, I mean, I, I do do a lot of experimental studies in the lab, but I have a number of field plots and sampling that I've, I've done over years as well. A um, number of different approaches, only one of which I've actually employed myself. It's sort of I, the way most people are doing it nowadays. Uh, you can actually do a mustard solution uh, to extract earthworms from the soil. Um, so what you do is you take uh, just commercial you can usually buy it at the bulk barn, for example, uh, mustard powder, it's a cooking powder, and you mix it with water. It's a 10 grams to a liter. Um, I find orange juice jugs, or sort of feeder jugs, do fairly well for that. So 40 grams of powder, liters of water, you mix that up. And then you pour that over the soil. So you, you move away the organic matter so you can get down to the soil. You pour it over slowly an area. Um, what do you try and sample if you're trying to be rigorous for an experiment? There are different approaches to it, but broadly speaking, you just pour it over. Uh, it acts as a mild skin irritant, uh, so they'll actually uh, pop to the oil surface, uh, and then you can grab them, get them, do whatever you need, need to do. Um, this fairly well in the uh, late fall or early spring when things are fairly moist and earthworms are fairly close to the surface. Uh, if it's really dry, really well, it doesn't work as well because you're relying on this solution to plate its way down. Not perfect in terms of being biased against certain functional groups or uh, earthworms that burrow in different ways. The architecture of the burrows really strongly affects how much of this will get into the soil. Uh, it's also logistically quite demanding if you're doing a lot of plots because you have to drag all this water out there. Uh, it does work very well. There are alternatives. Uh, there's uh, sort of an electroshocking approach. Um, you can just do physical vibrations, things like this, but the mud works fairly well. Uh, we have used this for things like children's eco camps 
it's sort of an activity that you can do uh, in your in your backyard or as a part of a broader outreach program. It's fun to just do up some mustard powder and, and go out and uh, just sample some worms. It, it it works quite well if things are are moist. And so just as a quick plug, if people are interested, see there's a few people on here I think are more stewardship oriented than management oriented in their in their career. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, but I just a quick plug, if people want to find that, um, that I guess written down and you know, a resource for how to ID different species of earthworms, Great Lakes Worm Watch is probably the best place to send them. So uh, Yeah, I I would say so. Yeah. Great Lakes Worm Watch, uh, it'll come up and there's the methods paper there. Um, and there's also a nice PDF you can download to help you ID different species of earthworms that we have in Ontario. Yeah, the little booklet is actually one that sits on my desk when I'm doing all my ID and whatnot. So it is a very good resource. I strongly suggest you check it out if you're interested in that at all. Uh, so, Michael, we just had one come in here. Um, so this sounds familiar, but I haven't had my earthworm hat on for a while, so maybe you can comment on it. But, um, there's a paper published. <laughs> Um, that cited earthworm density as having a negative impact on um, community composition for forest floor birds. Does that does that sound familiar to you, or is there anything you could? Uh, uh, it is vaguely familiar. Um, I've actually been fairly distant from a lot of the plant community impact stuff myself. So it was impacts on birds. Yeah, ultimately, so I think it was. And look at the actual citation here because I might butcher it. But um, the paper that linked earthworm density and how it would change the understory plant composition mm -hmm. on, on verbal direction for um, birds, I think, or, or other forest dwelling birds. There was a link there. I just I hope I'm not um, messing. But there is a paper published on the topic. If you can find it, that's that's the to go to. Sorry, do a great job explaining that one. But that's right. Yeah, I mean it's. The thing is that these are, you know, ecosystem engineering species. The main thing that they change is the vegetation. The vegetation dictates so much of which that ecosystem is or is not suitable for other species. So the spillover effects to uh, to anyone who's using them for habitat, for food, um, there is changes. I mean, it's all it's connected as it all as it always is. But it can have potential quite large effects fairly quickly and on unexpected species as well. Um, I'll have to check that one out. Thank you. Sorry, just a couple here. Oh, so mm -hmm. so um, so looking here. So we showed that there was a, a, a some preference by earthworms, and I guess people are wondering if if there's if that's out in other granivores or other seed predators. I guess um, there's a little bit of a literature on that. Things like all mammals and other birds being selective and what species they're going after. Yeah, and I, I mean, always there are always preferences. I think one way that becomes interesting here is uh, the sort of the uh, the granivore exclusion study that I did and and you did one at one point as well in in more of a forest system. Um, the question was, oh, you know, the earthworm effect is is slower or it's less pronounced. But one of the important things to consider there is that these species are often going after different types of seeds. So for firms, what you often, what they're often looking for in a seed essentially is something that is small, smooth, something that they can actually consume fairly easily. So not like a, a big spiky ragweed seed. On the other hand, if you're a bird or you're a mammal and you're less size limited, those larger seeds represent, you know, per unit foraging effort, usually a larger return in terms of energy from it. So species that are potentially going after different subsets of that seed pool. Uh, so it's not just a general seed impact who eats them, it's, it's, it's what they're going after really, really matters quite a lot in terms of shifting that community in of or against different species with different seed traits. So an extension of that idea would be, if, if I'm a um, going to the site restoration project here, and we know that native seed is a, very difficult to get in Ontario and be extremely expensive when we do find a good source of it. Mm. Uh, I guess if we do know that the site has a very healthy earthworm abundance, maybe from garlic um, or mustard spilling or some other technique, uh, maybe it would make sense then to kind of cross lists. If, if, if we're going to go in the route of seeding with native seeds, it might make sense to kind of cross reference that list of, of seed traits that we're using on our native selection. Maybe try to, to 
to throw, as you say, and Heather says from your lab, don't throw out a bunch of cheeseburgers for these worms, right? Uh, that that was my quote originally. It has since been adopted by uh, another participant in their lab, which happy to see it spreading around. But yeah, I mean, I think the idea here is that uh, let's say you're doing a restoration. This was a part of the experiment I wanted to do. Never, I sort of got sidetracked and didn't ultimately get around to it. But the way to do this would essentially be you've got a seeding list or a potential seeding list. You look at the seed traits, but also you go into the lab and, and you do some carry experiments where you, you specifically look at what do they prefer to consume, um, like actually, and sort of adjust your seeding list to compensate for that. And I think this can take different directions. So if there is a a desired species that you really want in the mix that they're really going after, I think you can go different routes. You can either say, um, this is going to be bubbled up, so it's a waste, so we'll just pull it out of the seed mix or just completely, or if it's a species you really want to be there, you actually increase the amount of seed in the mix to try and uh, or saturate the Grenivri effect and really push it through so it actually ends up in the community. Um, and I think that extends to not just looking at what you want in the mix, but what you don't want as well. So if you have weedy species that are present that you're trying to keep out, looking at which weeds are, are going to do better or worse with those earthworms present as well will give you an idea of what's going to be uh, major problems or maybe not a problem to manage when you're uh, managing that site. That's a great point. I think we often get a lot of questions about just pulling garlic mustard and, and um, consulting the BMP on it, but just kind of wondering, you know, how many years do these seeds hang around in the seed bank? And I think it's a, it's kind of a good mess maybe to leave off on. And the importance of managing garlic mustard is 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 important from like an understory plant diversity perspective. And if we can stop it from going to seed, um, you know, for a few consecutive years, I think seven seems to be the best number um, in a petri dish on a lab bench. There's seven years of seed viability. Mm -hmm. If we stop it from going seed, at least in theory, for seven straight years, we should have no new, um, I guess, seed bank actions expressing themselves. But so the mesh kind of out of out of some of your researchers that, that uh, is on the way. If we're from going to seed, there's also kind of you know we've got some agents on the inside helping express that seed bank in a different way too, right? That's my sense of it. I think more experimentation would, of course, be good, and it's going to vary from case to case. But in most, I do think this would be, uh, yeah, having a positive effect on that. And from an likely source, too, you know, from these exotic invasives that we're sort of stuck with. Just kind of doing us a solid here, it seems. Well, that's a good note to leave off on, making lemonade out of lemons. So with that, Michael, thank you much for your time today, and best of luck as you finish off your PhD. And uh, We'll space with you again soon. So thanks very much, and thanks All right, for, thank you. for participating in the series. Take care, everybody.